All right, everybody, thanks for coming on this really nice afternoon. It's a good day to be outside, but hopefully today you'll get excited and go and go want to be outside after some of the stuff we talk about today. Um, be pretty casual. What I hope to accomplish today, you know, with the, in light of uh, the fact that this is a conservation university class, so, so everything we're, we're doing, uh, we, we're looking at through the lens of, of water conservation, but um, I think people are often surprised at how basic horticulture practices, you know, good um, caretaking of, of your lawns, your landscapes, the natural environment lends itself to, um, to environmental stewardship, to water conservation. And so some of the things that we will be talking about today are just basic um, spring horticulture practices, maintenance tips, timing of planting and pruning and those types of things, but they all play a role uh, in, in this idea of how we um, conserve our resources as we look at keeping our lawns, our landscapes healthy and vibrant and beautiful. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in today. And then if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. This is a presentation that I put together in kind of partnership with, with two others. Julia Laughlin is a horticulture educator in Oklahoma County. And then Brenda Sanders is also a horticulture educator based out of Stillwater. And the three of us, um, this is kind of our brainchild. And, and um, so I want to give credit to those two for um, their role in this as well. I'm going to highlight a, the, what I'm considering the spring month. So it'll be March, um, April, and then some, some tips will cover into early May, but mainly March and April is what I'm going to be talking about. What you can be doing now through the end of April, beginning of, um, of May to uh, work in your garden, get your landscapes off to a good start. So March is, is a time where there's a lot happening in, there's really a lot happening, whether it be vegetable gardening or landscaping. Um, there's, there's maintenance, there's planting, there's prep. So there's lots to do in March. If you're maintaining a lawn, it's typically the time when you are thinking about weed control. So that pre-emergent weed control is usually put down by the middle or end of March. And I think I have some, some slides that will dive into that a little bit further, but some conventional wisdom, if, you, if you're one that responds well to that or you like little things to think about, when forsythia blooms or when, um, you could also say maybe when the Bradford pears bloom, the white blooms on those trees, that's a good time to make sure that your pre-emergent is down. Um, and so pre-emergent weed control happens in the, the late February to mid late March timeframe. If you're going to be establishing or, or overseeding a cool season lawn, many Edmond residents have shade in their landscape. They have established trees, some of that old growth forest as neighborhoods were built, they kept a lot of that. And so you have areas where you're maintaining tall fescue or perhaps other cool season turf grasses and those require seasonal over maintenance and overseeding maybe once every year to two years. The spring is a time where you can do that. The fall is, is by far the, the best time to overseed, but the spring from mid-February to early April would be a time where you could begin overseeding and establishing um, any areas of cool season turf that have begun to thin out. Preparing your annual flower and vegetable planting beds can begin now. Uh, last minute pruning, so it's definitely a good time to, to, to begin doing some pruning with the exception of some of the things that are blooming or setting bloom right now. You might want to wait. Um, roses, for instance, typically you'll wait till um, you know mid end of March to prune roses. A lot of the things that are in bloom right now would be best held until um, late March or early April, but for the most part, you can continue pruning right now. Warm season vegetables, if you do keep a summer vegetable garden, most of those things can go in as early as April 15th. So tax day is kind of the, one of those scary days of the year um, where we kind of mark it as, as, a, as our potential last freeze. That being said, you do have to pay attention. We've had years where the first week of May, we've had a, a freak freeze. And so um, it's a rule of thumb. Like anything, it's a rule of thumb. You can't control the weather, but in general, April 15th and on is a time where you can start putting those warm season vegetable transplants out into the garden. And so between now and then, you, if, you're, if you're gonna be starting anything from seed, you can go ahead and start those, get those germinated, 
and prepared so that you get a little bit of a head start on, on your summer vegetable garden. Things can also be going in right now. So potatoes are always planted mid-March, uh, usually around St. Patrick's Day. Spinach, radishes, lettuces could have been planted from early mid-February all the way into to the end of, April, uh, end of March. So those are all things that can be planted now. March is also a good time to begin dividing and replanting overcrowded plants, things that are summer and fall blooming perennials. Um, also, ornamental grasses, it's a great time to cut them back mid-February through the end of March is a great time to, um, to trim them back off the ground a little bit, remove a lot of that dead foliage, um, compost that if you're able to, and then that will allow that sunlight to get into the crown of those ornamental grasses and begin to have that new green growth come out. It's also a great time to start thinking about planting evergreen shrubs, um, bald and burlap and bare root trees and shrubs. So you can begin planting trees and shrubs now. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the presentation today. If you have any questions along the way, we're gonna keep this pretty casual. So feel free to, to just raise your hand, uh, chime in and I'll, I'll do my best to answer your question. April is when you begin any fertilization programs for warm season grasses. Uh, I actually tend to prefer that they be held off till May, but you can begin if you have a real intensive management program, you, you want a, a very, very intensively managed manicured lawn, you can begin in April. April to early May is when you can also begin thinking about establishing warm season lawns. Um, so if you're going to be renovating your yard or, or putting down new sod, it's a great time to begin doing some of those things. It's also a good time to, you'll, by April, you'll kind of have some indication of what uh, branches may be winter damaged or dead and so you can begin to kind of prune some of that out. It's also a great time to begin planting most bedding plants, summer bedding plants, summer flowering bulbs, again warm season vegetables, annual flowers. You can begin mulching in I would say early summer. Typically the the conventional wisdom is, is start mulching um, after some of the spring rains subside and that allows your soil temperatures to warm up and begin uh, your plants successfully. Another tip here, you can see right there the, the fourth bullet down there. Let spring flowering bulbs and foliage remain as long as possible before removing. I think a mistake that a lot of people make is as soon as the daffodils or tulips finish blooming, they cut those back and you significantly uh, reduce the chance or the likelihood of that bulb coming back next year if you immediately cut that green uh, foliage before it's really dried back because that foliage um, is collecting, it's photosynthesizing, collecting energy and storing it in that bulb for, for what it will need to produce um, foliage the next year. So if you just cut it back, they may end up not coming back or, be, or serving just as an annual. Um, whereas if you allow the foliage to remain there for a while, you'll, you'll ensure that you have a, a bulb that's going to come back year over year. Uh, it's a great time just to continue planting any landscape plants. Also, if you're into birds, specifically hummingbirds, other pollinators, um, they'll start to be showing up in your landscape as early as April. Hummingbirds tend to arrive in early April, and so that's typically the time you want to start thinking about preparing those feeders if you have hummingbird feeders in the landscape. Okay, May. So May is definitely when we're in the thick of, of gardening, uh, all the warm season things, establishing turf grass. It's when you may start thinking about your second application of pre-emergent weed control if you are dealing with some real um, troublesome weed issues. Most pre-emergent products that you would have or hire somebody to put down in February or March have about a 90 day window of effectiveness. And each product may be a little bit differently, but typically that buys you 90 day window. So if you apply a second application of pre-emergent in May or early June, um, that usually will get you through the entirety of the growing season and, and combating those, those weeds. Annual bedding plants can continue to be put in to, to add summer color. Um, you can begin planting those summer bulbs, can cannas, dahlias, elephant ears, caladiums, gladiolas, things like that. I don't know if any of you have water gardens, but if you have water gardens, there are some, some seasonal maintenance that occurs and May is a good time to do that. Clean those up, get those ready for, uh, for the season ahead. Okay, general tips for spring tree and shrub planting. In spring, you can really plant 
trees in any, any form. So whether it be a little tiny uh, slip tree, a uh, tree that's, that's bare root, sometimes you'll find trees that don't have any soil with them, they're, they're just bare root trees. Um, you can plant the, the containerized trees that you most commonly see when you go into a nursery. And then the larger trees are probably going to be in those big burlap balls. If you buy a really established tree, you can plant all three of those in the spring and it's a good time to do that. Yes. So like I planted some smaller trees last fall, should I be fertilizing them in the spring? Um, it kind of depends on, on what it is. Um, what, what did you plant? I don't remember all the names. Yeah, I, I would say... The tall, skinny, or tall skinny trees. trees. I would say call us and we can, we can look at what those trees are. You can always contact the extension office, send us a photo. We can look at what those trees are and kind of give you some recommendations on fertilization. It's always good to, to have a soil sample, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit, and give you some baseline um, kind of plan for what, when you fertilize and how you fertilize. Mm -hmm. I think one mistake people make with tree planting here at the second bullet point is they, they either plant the trees too low or they plant them too high. Uh, they don't develop a big enough uh, planting bowl for the tree. Ideally, you want to plant the, the top of that root ball right at the, the soil surface or just a, a hair above. Um, you also want the diameter of that hole that you put the tree in to be twice as big as the diameter of the tree's root ball when you take it out of the container. Another thing is a lot of people invest in peat moss or compost or all these things and try to use that as backfill to create this really rich planting area for the trees. And some research has shown that really that is not the, the best option for trees because they, they get so babied with that, that um, easy soil that they become root bound because they'll go, they'll go, they'll hit that wall of harder soil um, and then they'll just turn back in. And so really you want to fill back in with the native soil that, from the area that you've, you've excavated as much as possible. So real quickly, bare root trees. Anyone ever planted a bare root tree? So mostly these are going to be really, really small trees or fruit trees are often sold bare root. And it is, it is considered the best way to plant fruit trees. One kind of pro tip you'll notice as we go through the slides today, there'll be a few of these things that say tip. These are just kind of random pro tips that, that I've put in there. Um, if you're going to plant a bare root tree, it's a good time, it's a good idea to stick those roots in a five gallon bucket of water maybe 24 hours before planting and that really helps them uh, break dormancy and, and jump start their, their growing. It's also good to keep them covered maybe in a, in a bag or some sort of uh, fabric uh, instead of just leaving the roots exposed for a period of time before planting. If you're going to hold on to that tree for a week or two weeks before planting, make sure you get those roots covered. This is how most of us buy trees here in containers like you see here on the right of this slide. And container grown trees and shrubs can pretty much be planted year round. You mentioned you planted in the fall and the fall is a great time to plant trees for the most part um, with some exception. Spring is an excellent time to, to plant them as well though. And so you can see there in, talking on that second bullet point about the, the size of the root ball that we just discussed, um, the, the planting hole should be two times the diameter of this, this root ball here. So as you can see here on the slide, the planting hole should be twice the, the diameter of this, of this root ball for success. Another thing you can do is when you take them out of the containers like this, you can actually do what's called teasing the roots or pruning the roots. You can uh, rough up the roots on the side. You can take a, a shovel or something and just kind of scrape down on the sides and that encourages new root growth. Those feeder roots will, um, will do a better job of growing and establishing into that new planting hole. Bald and burlap trees, you'll sometimes see larger trees planted in what's known as bald and burlap. So it'll be a burlap fabric wrap around the root ball. And typically you'll also see this kind of metal wire cage to help hold that burlap and that, that stuff together. Those are mostly really established trees or larger trees that are planted in this way. And the reason they do it is because they actually use a machine. They pull them up out of the ground. Um, they're actually cutting sizable amount of their uh, root system out and bald and burlap are, are, is a great way to plant trees but there are certainly some management concerns that you need to pay attention to. They're a little bit more delicate and require a little bit more care to establish because they have gone into a little bit more shock. Yes ma'am. 
So if they lost part of the root system, should we prune the top to balance? The, the top of the trees? Yeah. Um, you can. I probably wouldn't do it immediately after planting. I would probably wait a little bit, but that's, that's a great question. It depends on how extensive they were cut, but I, I probably wouldn't do any harsh pruning immediately upon planting. One thing you really need to pay, pay attention to with these, and I think the, the biggest issue with bald and burlap trees is if you hire uh, a landscaping crew or you do it yourself, a lot of times they'll throw these trees in and they'll forget to rip the burlap and the wire back. And I've seen, I've heard stories of, of people having a, a newly established landscape and then maybe four, five, six years later, they start wondering why their trees are dying and they've survived for that period of time in the ground with this on there, but at a certain point they, they can't survive. And um, I've seen this actually quite a bit where you dig back the soil and there's still wire girdling the trunk of the tree or there's still burlap all over the root ball. And so that can really be a damaging thing if that's not removed when it's planted. Okay, so I'm gonna get into selecting some landscape plants really quickly here. We have a new publication called Water Efficient Landscapes for Oklahoma and it gives some general water conservation tips. It also gives you some options for plant selections that are well adapted to Oklahoma. If you go to our fact sheet website and you search this number here, you'll be able to find this publication in a PDF form. And the fact sheet website is just facts.okstate.edu. You can see the, the address at the top of every fact sheet there on the top right in a little box. What I like about this book is that it gives you images of each of the plants. It breaks the plants down by category. So whether it's annuals, perennials, trees, shrubs, turf grasses, ornamental grasses. And then it also gives you some, some basic information about it. It'll give you the, the common name, the scientific name. It'll tell you the season of interest. So here on this evening primrose, the example would be a, it's a summer uh, bloomer. So it's going to be at its prettiest in the summer. It will tell you how tall it will and wide it will grow. So about nine inches tall, 12 inches wide. On a scale of one to three, it will tell you its water needs. So a three does not mean, if you see, look here down at this foxglove beard tongue, it doesn't mean that it's a water, a heavy water needing plant. These are all water efficient plants, but relative to other plants in this book, this is going to need more water ongoing than, than this would. It also tells you whether it's a full sun plant or uh, a shade plant. And, and you can see here on, on the ones that I showed as examples, they're all full sun. It'll tell you whether it's native to Oklahoma or not native. So then it'll also give you a little bit of description on the plants. You can see here on the foxglove beard tongue, it says avoid wet soils, poorly draining soils, and it attracts hummingbirds. So there's some tips there for each of the plants. Yes, ma'am. So you know with the, the little water drops, is there a guide there that says if there's one water drop, you need to water this much, this many days? Uh, we don't have it broken down like that because that's going to be very specific to your location. Even within, within Oklahoma County, you can look at rainfall and precipitation rates and we may have two, three inch difference in one place to another in a county. So that's where um, We'll get into at other workshops. We won't get into a lot today in terms of managing water in the soil and in, in the landscape, but certainly in upcoming workshops and classes, we will get into that. That comes down to good um, common sense horticulture practices, knowing when it's, when it's rained, you know, checking the soil, feeling for moisture, things like that. And we'll talk about that. This is a database that the city of Edmond has on their website. I really encourage you to go to this plant database this, the fact sheet or the, the publication that you see here, Water Efficient Landscapes for Oklahoma, they took all the plants in this and they took, put it in a database on their website. So when you go to um, the City of Edmond Water Conservation site, you can find the Drought Tolerant Plant Database. You click on that and then you can set a search filter. You can say, I'm looking for perennial plants that are adapted to partial shade and have summer interest and it will generate those plants for you. So that's a, that's a great tip for you as well. The Oklahoma Proven Program is another place you can search for plants when you're looking for, for plants that are well adapted to Oklahoma, plants that you might be choosing this spring. Go to oklahomaproven.org. You can see there at the bottom of this slide and it'll take you to the main page. Um, it is a program started by Oklahoma State University in 1999, so it's gone on for just over 20 years now, and they select one 
annual, one perennial, one tree, and one shrub each year. So four plants per year. And they, they recommend those plants based on their proven uh, record of being great growers here in Oklahoma. So they hold up well to our extreme conditions of both dry and wet, hot and cold. Um, and so they, they kind of put those forward as things that they call Oklahoma proven plants. When you go to the website, you can, you can search plants by year. Here you can see on this slide, you can also search them by category. So whether it be annual, perennial tree or shrub, and then you can find some of the, the local nurseries that might have these plants as well. Hey Josh, don't they have a, uh, at the Oklahoma State University Gardens, don't they have a bed that's just the Oklahoma proven gardens? I believe so at the Botanic Garden in Stillwater, there is a place you can go see Oklahoma proven plants. We also have that at our Oklahoma County Extension Office. So our, our Extension Office uh, at 2500 Northeast 63rd Street here in Oklahoma City, we're in the process of, of completing it, but we have an Oklahoma proven um, garden area in our courtyard where you can see a lot of these plants. And there'll actually be some, some QR code um, signage on those plants where you scan your cam phone camera and you can see a short little video from our Oklahoma garden gardening television show host describing the that plant and how to care for it. You can also find all of those plants if you don't want to go to the website you can also s go to this PDF and it lists all the plants out just um, just like I described in that other booklet. Okay so doing some planting. Beginning in mid-March again you can start dividing your perennial plants and, and again the rule of thumb there is you you want to err on the side of dividing plants opposite the season that they bloom. So if they're a summer bloomer, then a, a, a spring dividing is fine. If they're a spring bloomer, you probably want to um, wait and divide those at another time. You can plant annuals. And again, you want to watch for that last freeze date for most of those sensitive annual plants. And that's going to typically be April 15th here in Oklahoma, but um, that can swing a week or two in either direction. So just kind of watch that. One tip for, for giving your plants the best success, especially um, if you're going to be doing vegetable garden transplants is to harden off the plants. So let's say you start them from seed indoors rather than once the weather's nice just going straight out to the yard you'll give them a, a much greater likelihood for success if you let them harden off and what you'll do to harden off is basically during the day you'll put them out in a kind of a low wind environment if you have it maybe right up in the the walkway by your house or along a back porch somewhere where they're outside, getting some sunlight, exposed to some wind, but they're not in those extreme conditions that they might be if you put them straight out into the garden. They get to harden off a little bit, set some strong roots, and you do that for a day or two, and then you can put them out into the garden. Uh, summer flowering bulbs, again, the, those cannas, dahlias, elephant ears, caladiums, um, those other, other summer flowering bulbs are great things to start planting in early May late April, early May, depending on the weather. But I have been told by people that they can sometimes be hard to find that time of year. So you'll start seeing them now. If you go into any garden center, you'll see them now and in, into early April and they tend to go pretty quickly. So I always find it's good to be a uh, early bird and get the worms So go, go plan now. And that's why you're here at this workshop so you can stay ahead of what needs to happen uh, in the spring. Buy your bulbs and things now with the anticipation of holding onto them and planting them um, as soon as weather is right at the end of April, beginning of May. One of the things I love to do each year is direct sow flower seeds. It's an easy, easy thing to do. Makes you feel like a really great gardener. And um, and actually, if you let the, on a lot of these, if you let their their heads that stay on the plant uh, and the foliage dry back. You can, you can trim this all down and, and just throw it back on the soil and you'll get most of those flowers to come back year after year. I have an area in my yard where I get zinnias that come back year after year after year um, just by dropping those seed heads, um, the, the, the blooms back onto the ground and covering them with a little bit of soil or mulch. Um, zinnias are a great one that can make anybody feel like a gardener. Um, Cosmos are another one I like, Morning Glories. You, you will be surprised. You do a little bit of uh, cultivation in an area and throw down those seeds and, and the success you can have. And you can trim these flowers and have cut flowers all season long. Really add some nice color to your landscape. Okay, pruning. You know, most pruning is gonna be done by, is, is gonna be a fall or early spring thing. You can continue to prune year round, but ideally you'll have done most pruning by by March, so by now. 
Um, however, spring flowering shrubs are the exception. So you're, uh, anything that's, that's flowering or blooming right now, you can um, prune as soon as that is done. Um, you prune to control the size and shape, fix the appearance. There are a lot of reasons that you prune. Training young plants, sometimes even pruning can be, be a big factor in keeping a, a plant healthy and, and uh, rejuvenate new growth. If you have trees that are in need of pruning or maybe you're, have, you're struggling with keeping turf grass growing under shade, sometimes simply proper pruning and limbing up of those trees will, will be the you know, an instant um, leg up in terms of success. I think people don't th take that into consideration enough. Even shade tolerant grasses like tall fescue can only tolerate a certain amount of shade. And most, or I, I say most, but a lot of Edmond residences I've, I've seen all over town have very, very shady landscapes that are gonna make it hard to grow or establish any turf grass. So limbing up those lower limbs a little bit, thinning out strategically some of the trees, not drastically reducing the shade in your landscape, but just, just kind of allowing a little bit of that filtered sunlight can go a long way in improving the success of turf grasses under trees. Um, if you do have any pruning done, I always suggest that people have a certified arborist do the work. At most, you wanna avoid somebody that's just gonna to top your trees. Um, you've probably seen trees when, they're, when they don't have leaves that have like all over their canopy have just been hacked. Um, we call that dehorning or topping of trees. It doesn't leave the tree healthy and, um, and doesn't set it up for success long-term. Most of those trees become susceptible to diseases and all sorts of issues. And so uh, good proper pruning is really key, especially with trees. Things that you wanna prune are dead, dying, and broken branches. Bradford pears, lacebark elms, Chinese pistache. There are a lot of trees that really have this problem of branches growing inward. You can kind of see that here. They're just kind of growing in on itself. And if you don't allow, if you don't do some pruning and clean that up, you can really cause some um, major issues, limbs growing into each other. So checking on these once every year or so is really, is really important. And it's easier to catch it when those limbs are younger than when they're older. So you would come in and you just prune. You don't want to prune right down to the, to the next limb, but just above, you know, an inch or so at that collar, you would prune out any of that interior growth. Uh, suckers, anything growing from like the base or the trunk of the tree um, are things you could remove. In s trees that are susceptible to storm damage and things, you might want to look at those weak angles, uh, things less than 30 degrees and consider some pruning there. So just scout your trees. It, may, it, it pays to pay attention to that and to think about uh, pruning. It will give you stronger, healthier, more successful trees in the long run. All right, we'll start talking about pruning spring flowering shrubs and ornamental grasses. For Scythia, Wigilia, Spirea, Lilacs, Azaleas, all of those, it's a great time to fertilize them. So right after they bloom, and then you can also do some pruning right after they bloom. And again, reminder, when For Scythia blooms, when those Bradford pears blooms, you should be getting those pre-emergent uh, weed control products on the lawn. So right now, you'll, you'll be seeing that For Scythia blooming all over town right now. Also ornamental grasses, here are some, I think this is miscanthus, maybe some maiden grass here. And this dry dead foliage from the year before, this is the previous year's growth. Uh, you just wanna come through and, and give it a haircut. And then you can see it allows that new growth coming from the crown of that plant here on the, on the right to have that sunlight penetrate and begin to allow it to uh, have the energy it needs to grow. Um, you can, you can get by without cutting it, but you're gonna have a much uglier looking uh, plant the year ahead. And you'll have a mix of, of green and, um, and golden growth all intertwined. Yes, sir. Yeah, what, what is the technical name of the, or what's the name of that grass right there? Because my, I'm here for my wife and she's, she wasn't able to come. And we do this every year and it is very effective. It helps. Yeah, and what's the name of it? I believe this is a miscanthus, uh, a maiden grass. Uh, Brenda, is that right? Yeah, br my, my resident horticulture expert has given me the heads up. I think it's, a, it's called maiden grass. It's a miscanthus. And there are different, different uh, cultivars, so I couldn't tell you what cultivar it is, but I believe it's a miscanthus. Um, and most ornamental grasses are gonna respond really well to a cutting like this. Even that they molly, do, they, they, they do. That molly grass, it's good. I'm not sure I'm saying it properly. Pink, pink Yeah, that one, the pink one, the real, because they get really tall. 
So even those you want to cut short? You're talking about the pampas, the really big ones with the plumes? Oh, those two, but the, I'm seeing the pink. The pink ones, yeah, those can, those can certainly be cut back. Grass needs to be cut back. Yep. So if it's grass, it's got to get cut right now. Okay. <laughs> you're the old, and, and your new will look much nicer. All right, we're going to start talking a little bit about spring vegetable gardening. You, you know this, Oklahoma has four seasons and we might experience all four of them in one week, but we do have four seasons here in Oklahoma. And uh, so we have our spring season, which is typically uh, mid-February, and it's when you can start planting those cool season crops. When we're talking vegetables, you can start planting a lot of vegetable crops in, in February. Um, onions, lettuce, spinach. Um, cabbage, you know, those types of things. Broccoli, uh, there's a huge list. Then our summer crops would be things that you start planting in mid-April and onward, and those are the, the typical things we think of, tomatoes and okra and corn and things like that. Fall crops, I don't know if many people do fall vegetable gardens, but August is the time that you would begin planting fall vegetable gardens. And then winter, you can do season extension. This is actually a garden in Stillwater um, and I took this in December. There were some vegetables and things growing in December under these what are called blow tunnels. So you take plastic covering and it allows you to extend the growing season and, and grow things when you wouldn't normally be able to grow outside. Also these cement blocks I think help uh, warm up the soil. So there are ways that you can grow year round. But talking about spring, really now would be a great time if you have a vegetable garden to be out there and begin preparing that site, cultivating the soil. There are certainly different ways that you can manage a vegetable garden. Anybody here keep a vegetable garden? You got two, three, four. There, there are people who are the till often and frequently, and there are people who are the don't till ever and at all. And I, I think there's, there's certainly a, a balance between that. Um, over cultivation, if you till your soil too much, you really can destroy its, its structure and you can damage it especially if you're tilling when the soil's really wet. But some cultivation in a vegetable garden setting may be necessary to really help um, prepare that soil for planting. You can mulch with organic matter, compost, you know, incorporating a layer of compost on top of that site that you're gonna garden in each spring may be helpful. Cover cropping would typically be something, if you're gonna be doing a spring or summer vegetable gardening, you would have put a cover crop in in the, the fall or winter and you would be turning it under. So now would be a great time in, in the spring right now to be cultivating your your beds and preparing. Uh, I doubt any of you actually put a, a cover crop in, but if you did, uh, it would be a great time to start tilling that under. We have these warm days preparing your, your vegetable gardens for planting. Warm season versus cool season crops. So again, warm season crops are gonna be those summer vegetables, those things you plant in the summer. And those cool season crops are gonna be things that can can go through the, the winter or late winter, early spring, and can withstand temperatures that get down into the 20s. So here in Oklahoma County, we typically have our last freeze on tax day, and usually our first freeze in the fall is right around Halloween. Um, and so you can pretty much grow between tax day and Halloween, or even Thanksgiving in some years, you can grow a lot, a lot of things. And then with the use of, of season extension, using co uh, covers in the garden, low tunnels and things, you can even grow beyond that. So we have a very long growing season compared to many places in the country here in Oklahoma. We have a fact sheet and you, you have it in your packet today, uh, Oklahoma Garden Planning Guide. It lists cool season and warm season crops. So right now would be the time that you would be thinking about these cool season crops. And you'll see here on that fact sheet, a list of crops. So on the far left under the vegetables you'll see all of these vegetables listed and then just to the right of it the time that it would be planted. You can also see here how many days expected to harvest and then how you would plant it. Uh, for instance, instance beets can be planted all through March. It takes about 50 to 70 days to harvest and you plant from seed. So that's the way you would use that chart. Okay getting into spring lawn care and again this is this presentation is throwing a lot of management things at you. And so there will be some things that are applicable to all of you, some things that are applicable only to a few of you. This is one that I think most of you are gonna deal with. We all have turf grass probably in our landscapes of some sort, whether it be a warm season or a cool season. I'm showing you this image here to show you, uh, th these are cool season turf grasses on the top and warm season below and then you see winter, spring, summer, fall, winter. So over the course of the growing season, 
Cool season grasses, those are those grasses that are gonna be green right now in the cool winter months, things like tall fescue. They have two distinct growing seasons during the year. And that's why we have two periods during the year where we can establish them. So we, we always wanna establish right ahead of each growing season. So we can establish cool season grasses in the spring, so February and March. We can also establish them in the early fall in September and October. What you'll notice, the difference between cool season and warm season grasses is warm season grasses have one uh, kind of sustained period of growth through the, the spring, summer, and early fall, and then they go, they go dormant. Warm season grasses also have a lot less susceptibility or a lot less tolerance, rather, of shade. And I get a lot of people ask me, well, why is that? Why do warm season grasses not hold up under shade like some cool season grasses? There are a lot of factors, but one thing you'll notice when are most landscape trees leafed out? They're gonna be leafed out during the summer months, which is the peak growing time for most warm season grasses. Whereas the summer months is the, the least active growth period for a lot of cool season grasses. So in the, the spring and the fall when trees are gonna have the least amount of leaf coverage and the most amount of sunlight is gonna be able to come through, that's when these, are, these cool season grasses are actively growing. So they're gonna have naturally uh, better uh, adaptability and tolerance to shady conditions in our landscape. You also have this fact sheet in your packet. This is the Bermuda grass lawn management calendar. There's one for, for warm season grasses like Bermuda grass. There's also one for cool season grasses. You'll find that it gives you a 12 month breakdown of the year and all of the management activities that you would do in a lawn management setting. So if you're doing all of the lawn care for yourself, then much of this would apply if you're only doing the, the watering and the mowing and you're only doing a portion of it, then you can go through and look at this calendar and select those maintenance things that you're responsible for as a homeowner and, and determine when and how often and to what degree you would need to be doing those things. Uh, so for instance, I've highlighted here on this slide, you can see in yellow, I've highlighted the months of February, March, and April. And you can see that April is the very, very end of April, it would be just the beginning window of when you would establish warm season grasses. You can do things like dethatching during this time period. So if you have a, a lawn that has heavy thatch buildup or needs to be aerated, um, those are some of the management things that could be going on right now. Uh, weed control, pre-emergent, all of those are activities going on during the spring months. And this calendar does a really, really nice job of breaking that down for you. Question. Jeff, for um, weed control post-emergent and pre-emergent, do you have any techniques that are proven to work that don't imply using that type of product? Yeah, there, so the question is, are there techniques to control weeds that don't use any chemical substance, basically? Is that the question? Yeah, there certainly are some techniques that you can use. I'll, I'll tell you that anytime you, you make a, a, it's like a, a scale balance, you remove something, you know, it, it then, and you, you uh, manipulate one area, then you, you, you kind of have to um, expect a lopsided balance in another area. And so what I mean by that is uh, you can certainly achieve some level of weed control in a lawn without using chemical herbicides, um, but your maintenance, your, your labor input is gonna go way up in terms of the ongoing labor that would be involved to do that. There are some products out there um, that are more natural and certainly you can look into those. They're increasing all the time in, in terms of what's available. We're also currently going through some research right now, um, some kind of applied research trials at OSU Stillwater at our Perkins Research Station showing different ways to, um, to eradicate um, like weeds or in this case, it would be basically killing out Bermuda in preparation for putting in a flower bed or something, but doing it with solarization and other methods that are, that are non-chemical, more, more uh, cultural controls. It's kind of a long-winded answer to your question, but yes, there are some options available. The, the easiest options are gonna be a, an herbicide option. And so you have to, when you, when you decide that that's not for you, then you have to also come with a new set of, a new paradigm in terms of how you would manage your lawn. And that's, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. I encourage that. I would prefer you to, to use um, limited amounts of herbicide and, and weed control products. And so really the answer to that question then would be, 
your soil health and your management practices. If you can, if you can develop a lawn or a, a garden or flower bed that has healthier soil, healthier plants, and you're managing it efficiently, then you reduce the need for any of those uh, inputs. Not necessarily eliminate it altogether, but you certainly reduce those needs. Um, in a lawn setting, for instance, a lot of people right now are complaining about the purple flowers that are all over lawns, all over the metro, right? Those are, that's called henbit. You can certainly eradicate that from a Bermuda grass lawn using an herbicide, and you can do it effectively and very quickly. However, you can also wait it out, and by the end of April, you mow it. By the end of April, it'll die and wither as the temperatures warm up, it'll go away, and you won't even know it had been there. So if you can tolerate it being there for a period of a few weeks, um, to a month, then you can get by without having to use those herbicide products. And so that's what I mean by kind of changing your paradigm. This is specifically about that one. Um, I decided to just pull them by hand um, okay. on a patch that was mm -hmm. kind of thick. And my husband on a different patch decided to burn them, like on the surface. Yeah. He didn't do like a control, like, yeah. you know. Uh, are any of us being which one of us is using the best method? His was faster, obviously. Right. Right. Uh, I've, I've, I've done both of those in my landscape. Um, and I've, with Hinbit, for instance, Hinbit's not a very, it, it looks like and feels like it's super aggressive, but really if you get down and you mow it low or you pull it by hand or burn it, you'll, you'll get control of it pretty quickly. Um, neither method is bad. The, it, it really kind of depends on what would be best for you. Um, burning is, is fine um, in, a, in a small scale setting. You really have to be careful about that in a landscape setting and be very controlled about how you do it. Some spot burning with a little, a little propane torch or something can work. And I use that as a weed control method in, in my lawn uh, throughout the growing season. Hand pulling is a great way as well. The, a lot of those, those physical um, methods of control that are alternatives to an herbicide are, are great ways. But like I said, that involves you being out there physically doing something. And so you kind of have to weigh those options. I would much rather you do it that way um, than using an herbicide if you're able to do that. And I can give you some, some other, I mean, there are some, you know, I'm not really answering your question basically is, is what way is better. And, and there's not really an answer I have for you. I would say burning is effective. Um, it's certain weeds and certain landscapes are going to respond and certain times of year are going to respond differently to burning. Certain weeds are going to respond well to pulling and others won't. Henbit is going to do pretty well if you, if you physically pull it, but other, other weeds that, for instance, uh, a nut sedge, a yellow nut sedge, if you pull a nut sedge and you don't get the entire root system, it's going to come right back. So it's going to depend on what the weed is, how you're doing it, um, so there's no silver bullet answer to your question. Hope that helps. Yeah, it's just that on my previous question, I was wondering if there's any kind of list of environmentally safe products that can be used. We have a, we do have some of that. We have a fact sheet series called the Earthkind Fact Sheet Series, and you can look that up on our fact sheet website, and it lists out some management methods. So it lists out, it's kind of an IPM approach, an integrated pest management approach. So it lists out not only physical, uh, methods like we've just described, but also some of the products that are available, the natural and alternative products. We also have a program coming up in April, on April 18th. Uh, it's a program of OSU Extension, so it's not a City of Edmond program, and it's called EarthKind Earth Day. It's an all-day event, and we will be covering some of those concepts at that workshop. I'm not prepared to give you a list of products or describe that today. We just don't have the time for that, but certainly that workshop would be a great one for you to go to if you're interested. Um, it's not in Edmond, it's in Oklahoma City, and you can catch me at the end and we'll, we'll be able to talk you through that. Yeah, question. question. Do commercial uh, landscape people use, we control chemicals that hurt birds? That hurt birds? I would say... Notice that we used to not do weed control. We started a couple of years ago and it seems to me like we have fewer birds than we used to. You probably have fewer birds because you have fewer bugs. Um, to be honest with you. If, you, if you're controlling those pollinator loving plants or the plants that bugs are gonna be attracted to, you're gonna have less birds attracted to your property. And so really, I would say no, they're, the pesticides they're using probably are not, or the, I mean the herbicides rather, are probably not um, doing anything to the birds. 
but they are making your landscape less exciting to insects, which makes it less exciting to birds. Uh, some of the other things, dethatching, airification, fertilization, and irrigation, all are things to be thinking about for a warm season lawn in uh, April and May. And irrigation, I'll talk on briefly. You'll find that if you look at the irrigation charts for Bermuda grass, so this is, this is that slide here. What I did is I took all of the months of the year, 20 year average from 1998 to 2013 from the Mesonet site from here in Oklahoma County. And I took the, the need by month based on weather conditions for Bermuda grass and then our average precipitation here and, and that gives me whether we need, it, we need rainfall or irrigation or not. So you take the need of the Bermuda grass here based on our weather conditions and how much rainfall we get. And you find that here in Oklahoma uh, County, here in central Oklahoma, with the exception of July and August, we actually don't need to be supplementally irrigating our Bermuda grass lawns whatsoever for them to be healthy, viable lawns that will continue to, to thrive. Now, certainly we tend to wanna have a very lush soft lawn that is as, as deep green and, and as, as nice as possible. A lot of people are going for that. And so you're, uh, you may decide that there are some need for supplemental irrigation in order to achieve that. Also, what you'll find is that this is assuming that all of this rainfall was effective. We know that the harder, more compacted our soils are, the more likely that that water, some of that water is not gonna make it into the soil. And so uh, that's just a general rule of thumb again, but at the end of the day, I tend to encourage people to really think about supplementally irrigating turf grasses really just in the peak summer months. And you can get by turning off your irrigation system on, on turf grass for the rest of the year. Tall fescue is going to be another story, and we'll, we'll see that here in just a second. Quick question on yes. the patching. You know, you, you mentioned uh, every two to three years, and I have, uh, do you qualify that with uh, you know, people who use multi mowers versus collect, because I, I quite frankly, I've, I've gone out before and I've looked to see if I could find any thatch, and I never find any thatch buildup. Right. And that probably means you're mulch mowing. Are you mulch mowing? That's correct. Right. So dethatching is, is not going to, or I mean, sorry, thatching rather, is not going to occur as a result of leaving your lawn clippings on the lawn. Thatch accumulation is the result of over fertilization of a lawn. And so if you're over fertilizing, you're, you're pumping that vegetative growth on that Bermuda grass, let's say, um, then you will over time develop some thatch buildup. Um, whereas if you're mulch mowing, that's, that stuff is um, separated from the plant so it dies and actually decomposes and actually feeds the soil. Whereas thatch buildup is gonna be living vegetative material that grows so densely that it shades itself out and dies and, and becomes a, a problem. Um, so that accumulation is not going to be an issue that everybody needs to deal with every two to three years. But if you are doing a very heavy maintenance regime on your lawn, you're having it fertilized three to five times a year and you're, you're pumping um, irrigation on it very regularly, it's a very high maintenance lawn, the odds are that you're going to have to deal with some some thatch accumulation issues over time. So great question. So we'll, we'll move into um, cool season really quickly. So again, the, the same calendar is available for cool season lawns. If you have a tall fescue lawn, I encourage you to look at this calendar. It covers the 12 months of the year and breaks down some of the maintenance things that are going on. You'll, you'll typically hear people say when it comes to irrigation, one inch per week. You hear that thrown around a lot, one inch per week on during the growing season. And that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Again, we're talking rule of thumbs, but you have to remember that that's not factoring in precipitation. So if we get rainfall, if we don't get rainfall, that's you make the decision of whether you would be irrigating or not based on that. Uh, and we don't have a lot of time to go in this, into this today, but there are some ways to help you as, as a um, homeowner in managing your lawn, make a determination of, okay, if, I'm, if I need to water an inch this week, how, how, what does that translate into turning on my sprinkler system for a length of time? What you'll find with tall fescue, this is the exact same chart that we use for the, the Bermuda grass, but tall fescue has a higher water need, and it also is actively growing more of the year. So we actually have a, a need for supplemental irrigation on tall fescue almost every month of the year. 
Um, and so from a sheer water use standpoint, warm season grasses like Bermuda grass are gonna be far more efficient and, and um, resource efficient, water efficient than a tall fescue. Um, but then you have that, that shade um, dynamic that you have to deal with. If you are gonna be doing some weed control, the, the spring is, is a time you can be doing both pre and post emergent control in uh, cool season lawns as well. You'll find that some people will do insect control in mid to late April as a preventative control. I really don't encourage people doing uh, preventative grub control on their lawn unless they've just had a, a history of really, really bad problems and, and skunks or armadillos tearing up their grass in search of those grubs. Um, generally, they're, they're not enough of an issue to really cause damage and, and um, be worth somebody spending money on unless there's a history of damage there. You can do a cult, what's called a, a cultural control later in the summer in August to, to kind of stay on top of anything that you notice that might have occurred in the growing season. Quickly highlight soil testing. Anyone ever done a soil test? Good, a few of you. So I, I would say soil testing is really, really important if you're going to be applying any sort of fertilizer. Um, it's, it's also just a great general way to get a roadmap for where you need to go in terms of getting your, your soil um, productive. If you're going to be doing any vegetable gardening or you're, you're going to be a building or establishing a new landscape area, doing a soil test is a great way um, to do that. You know, we, I use a GPS to get around and go everywhere and I know where I want to go. I don't necessarily know how to get there. It provides a route and the soil test does the, exactly that uh, for growing uh, your landscape. Uh, so when you collect a soil sample, I think a lot of people have some um, uncertainty about how this is done. You have the greatest potential for error in collecting a soil test um, when you're collecting the soil. And so what you want to do is you want to go around your area. So in this case, it would be a lawn, but it could be a, a, a vegetable garden, a flower bed, whatever. And you want to collect soil from multiple spots. Don't just go to one spot and take a bit of soil and then think that that's going to be a representative test of what you've got or sample of what you've got going on. There can be so much variation within a small area in terms of soil. So you'll actually collect from uh, 15 or so spots around a given area. Um, so let's say your front lawn, you want to do a soil test to determine what fertilization needs might be needed on your front lawn. You can go and take soil from 15 spots across your lawn, put it in a bucket, like you see here in this picture, mix it all together, and then put that in a, a Ziploc bag and bring it to your local extension office, and we can provide a soil test for you. Uh, so here's some examples of what that looks like. You would want to separate areas out. So for instance, we would do a, a different sample for our vegetable garden than we might do for our front lawn. And let's say our back lawn is all tall fescue and it's heavily shaded and our front lawn is full sun and it's Bermuda, we might do two separate samples for those as well. You find that the nutrients that are in question are gonna be kind of concentrated in that four to six inch depth. And so ideally you'll be getting soil that's in that four to six inch soil depth. Um, so you can actually come to the extension office and check out a probe like you see here on the, the right of this slide, which allows you to easily do that without damaging um, the landscape any. But you can also just take a, a shovel and just kind of lightly spade up a little bit of soil collect from underneath and then, and then pat it back down and um, go about your, your business. If you're gonna be fertilizing your lawn, how many, you, you said that you have lawn, how many of you said you have lawn care companies that take care of your lawn? Have you ever had a soil test done on your lawn before that fertilization was added, right? And so what you'll find is that that's, that's fine. A lot, of, um, a lot of people never think to, to ask that question and from a, a lawn care company's perspective, they're, they're trying to effectively and efficiently get people's lawns treated, and they're doing a lot of lawns over a large area. Um, so they, they tend to use similar products, balanced fertilization products. But you may find that by doing a soil test that you have one of those macronutrients, for instance, a phosphorus or potassium that is really high or really low. And if you over apply fertil fertilizers, um, those can ultimately lead to um, pollution of, of waterways and things. Um, if you've ever noticed a neighborhood pond or uh, a, a fishing hole during the summer go from being clear to instantly having green algal growth all over that filamentous algae, that is generally caused by, uh, we've just, uh, we have a heavy rain, washes all that fertilization into the water, 
and that causes that that's food for that algae and so it causes that algal bloom and it's usually phosphorus um, that is the, the problem, um, that middle number in a fertilizer. And so when you fertilize based on a true understanding of what your needs are, you, you limit um, that from happening. So let's say you take a soil test and it says that you have an elevated or, or sufficient P and K, then you would know, okay, I just need to buy a fertilizer product that's going to give me nitrogen, which is what um, is the most key ingredient for plant growth. So those three numbers on any, any bag, whether it be compost, or a, a, a synthetic fertilizer product, those three numbers are always gonna be the same. The first number is nitrogen, the second number is phosphorus, and the third number is potassium. And so in this case, this product would be 34% nitrogen. If your, if your soil sample shows that you're low in phosphorus or potassium, you might use a balanced product like a triple 19 or a triple 13. It's always good to base your fertilization based on an understanding of what your needs are. So I recommend every two to three years you can do a soil sample. It's probably not going to change very much over a two to th three year period. Um, so do a soil sample and then maybe every three years re revisit it. So fertilizers, how much to apply? So we, we, let's say your soil sample results tell you that you need to apply one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet and this is the fertilizer product that you bought. So you bought a 1648. Um, it, you can't just scoop one pound of this weigh out this product and get one pound of, of, the, of the nitrogen because this is only 16% nitrogen. So you do a little bit of math and you actually find that you're going to need 6.25 pounds of this product to deliver the one pound of nitrogen that your lawn actually needs. So just keep that in mind. Um, when you buy a, a product, know that this number tells you. So let's say this number was a, a 20 here you'd need five pounds of that product, right? That's some simple math to kind of help you understand how to, and, and when you do a soil sample, if you do a soil sample through our office, we explain all this to you and we actually do this math for you. So we actually will do the calculations and give you a precise number that you would need to put down and, and help you do that. Okay, getting into irrigation systems. We have an irrigation system checkup fact sheet that is available and we will cover this in a future Conservation University program this this year. Uh, we covered it last year and we'll be going a little bit more in depth this year, but it'll just help you get a, an idea of how to spruce up your sprinkler system and ensure that you're going to be watering efficiently as you go into the growing season. I encourage people to consider thinking about their sprinkler system once a year, typically in the spring, ahead of when you might be using it regularly. You'll find that Sprinkler systems can have things break without you even realizing it. Maybe you have a, a, a teenage kid at home and they hop the curb and, and break a sprinkler head or you have a, a, somebody mowing the lawn and they accidentally hit a head with a, a mower or a weed eater. Um, over time things just break and so it's good to get your eyes on your system at least once a year. Here in the city of Edmond there's a, an odd and even watering schedule, a mandatory watering schedule. So it's good to make sure you check your, your controller and make sure you're watering on the right days and that you're watering the right length of time. A lot of times our irrigation systems are running overnight or early in the morning, so we're not physically seeing them running. So we wouldn't know unless we checked whether it was running for nine minutes or 90 minutes. And I have actually seen when we've done um, these checkups, I've seen people who thought that their irrigation system was running for nine minutes and it was running for 90 minutes. I've actually seen one where it was running nine hours and they didn't realize nine, nine hours overnight and they were wondering why their water bill was really so high. So these things do happen um, and it's not always your fault. You just, you just don't realize that that's what's going on and, and some simple investigation can help solve that problem. So check your, your timer. You can also run a test uh, cycle on, on all controllers and it'll let you walk through the landscape and it'll go through zone by zone and kick on the sprinkler systems and then you just get your eyes on issues that might be going on in uh, in your landscape. In that fact sheet there's actually a little place where you can write in problems and make a note so you kind of know what repairs are, are going to need to be done. Uh, here's some pictures of just some of the things that you might see that I saw when doing this. Wildlife damage. I'm going to briefly talk about this as well. Again, I'm throwing a lot of, a lot of random topics at you today, um, just kind of setting the stage for, for what you as uh, somebody managing a landscape, uh, home garden, might be dealing with here in the city of Edmond. Um, so we've talked everything from establishing turf grass, growing vegetable gardens, irrigation systems, now we're talking about wildlife damage. But moles and gophers are probably among 
the, the most problematic wildlife that I get asked about here in the city of Edmond. People call and say, oh, I have, I have moles and gophers, um, or I have, I have gophers damaging my landscape. How, how can I deal with it? But there are other things, deer eating plants. If you live near a wooded area, you may have all sorts of issues. We have a section on our fact sheet website. You can actually just, just search uh, wildlife damage and this will come up. And it's a frequently asked questions wildlife damage section. And you can scroll through, find a question that you're looking for. This one says, do I have moles or gophers and how do I catch them? Click on that, it'll go through a whole article explaining that. Talking specifically about moles and gophers though, Anyone know the difference between moles and gophers? I know you do. What's the what's the plant from one eats is a carnivore. Right. So that's exactly right. One eats plants, and one is more interested in in um, worms and, and grubs and things in your soil. Moles are going to be completely subterranean for the most part. They're going to they're going to burrow under the ground. They're not going to leave little mounds. So if you see little mounds, you're dealing with a gopher. Moles are also interested in your worms and grubs and other things in the soil. Whereas gophers, they leave the mounds and what they're really interested in is feeding on the, the, the tender bulbs and roots and things. So if you have um, bulbs in your garden, if you have um, vegetable plants, they, they love to feed on all of those things. And so they, they are really the most nuisance for gardeners. There are a lot of control options and methods out there. For the most part, I really don't recommend controlling unless it's really a major, major issue. Um, there are, they can be a nuisance, but there are some benefits that they, they provide as well. They aren't currently protected by state or federal law, so it's actually open season. If you need to control them, you can um, do it yourself or hire that out. They're really a major concern in, in crop settings. They can, they can really decimate crops. Uh, from a home garden perspective, you really have to weigh out whether you want to invest the time, money, and resources to control them or just kind of deal with it. They do have benefits. Like everything in, in an ecosystem, there are, there, when there's a downside, there's also a, a, an upside, right? And so they do increase soil fertility. They're, they're digging around and, and making your soil um, more fertile by uh, pooping and depositing organic material and bringing that vegetative material down into their, their dens. Um, they are aerating and um, helping reduce compa soil compaction and water infiltration. So there are a number of benefits, but you may reach the point at the end of the day where you decide that you need to control them. And uh, our fact sheets will, will walk you through some of the methods of controlling. Typically, it involves kind of a two-pronged approach. Um, you, you can trap, you can also poison, um, but that typically you have to hit them with, with kind of two methods if you have a really heavy infestation to, to control them effectively. Um, and for sake of time today, we don't have time to go into a lot of those details, but the fact sheet will walk you through some of those methods. You wanna be careful using toxicants that you get those into burrows themselves um, because those toxicants can, can be harmful to other animals, dogs and, and things. And so you really wanna be careful about using those properly and effectively. And so it may um, be that you hire a professional to, to do that if you reach the point where you decide you need to control them. Yeah. Yes, sir. A couple of questions. One, which one is it that has their tunnel close to the surface like in Bermuda, you can tell? That would be a, a, probably a mole. If there's no burrows or mounds, probably a mole. And then do you see a lot of voles? Voles, yes. Depending on where you are, you, you do see some voles. Um, and I don't, I don't notice those being as much of a, a landscape damager. They would be more like a gopher in the sense that they're going to feed on vegetative stuff and less of a, um, those moles, the reason you see them in Bermuda grass like that is because they're trying to go after those grubs that like the roots of that, that Bermuda grass. That, that is the presentation. I'm going to go through some, some quick things, um, highlight. Uh, the extension service and some resources that you can you can look to and then I'll open it up for some questions. I threw a lot at you today, a lot, a lot at you. This is a presentation that I normally try to stretch over a three hour period, but you have the slides, you have the access to the fact sheets and so now you can be um, prepared to dig in a little bit deeper in the areas of relevance for you. So the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service, if you're not familiar with who we are and what we do, we are a branch of Oklahoma State University. Um, all land-grant universities have three missions, where, whereas any university is going to teach students and conduct research, a land-grant school has a federally mandated mission to extend knowledge 
and be a resource to the citizens of their state. So Oklahoma State University as a land grant school, um, we have extension professionals like, like myself and we get paid to, to be um, a resource for the, the citizens of our state. And so that's what I do in, in the Oklahoma uh, Extension Service. You can go to our website, oces.okstate.edu, and find out more about the Cooperative Extension Service. There's a lot of resources there. We actually have 77 counties in Oklahoma and 77 extension offices. So there are 77 other folks like me, or actually more than that, but at least 77 other folks like me helping people at each county in different areas in different ways. Um, so if you live in or have family in another county or you happen to find yourself at a certain point in another county you can do a, you can process soil samples you can do water samples um, you can go and get free information and, and support at any of those county offices around the state if you go to that website oces.okstate.edu you can access this or you can just type in the facts.okstate.edu web address that you see on the top of every fact sheet that you have and that'll bring you to this page this is our facts sheet website. So those fact sheets that you have in front of you today, the, the black and white ones, you'll notice on the top right corner the little web address, it'll bring you here and you can go to this search bar at the top. You'll, you'll need to hit search and then it'll open up this search bar here and you can type in any search term that you're interested in, whether it be gophers or annual flowers or irrigation systems and it will pull up thousands and thousands of different free fact sheet resources for you. Um, so I, I happened to search uh, irrigation systems, pulled up managing pressure in the home irrigation system. What I like about it is that you can, you can read it online or you can go over there on the, the left orange uh, bar there and you can actually print a PDF version of the fact sheet like you would see the black and white ones there. If you have specific questions, let's say it's like a four or five page document and you're really interested in how much water can I save by reducing pressure in my irrigation system? You can click on that, it'll take you specifically to that question and, and the, the material that'll answer that rather than having to read two or three pages of material. So very, very helpful. Um, if you go to calendar.okstate.edu slash OCES, you'll actually pull up our statewide calendar and you can come over here to the left and set search filters. So you can search all counties or you can search Oklahoma County or um, you can search by horticulture or gardening. You can set all these filters and then it'll pull a list of events that we have available to you and you can actually register and, and, and log on and, and access those events there. Another thing that I really, really want to highlight is our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Anybody familiar with our Oklahoma Gardening television show? So every Saturday morning at 11, Sundays at 3.30, we have a PBS show called Oklahoma Gardening. And we're actually uh, being graced by a former host, Brenda, back here. She was the host in, uh, from 96 to 2000 of the TV show. And uh, I think this is an underutilized resource. The, t the television show is great, but this YouTube channel, if you go to the Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel, don't search up here because you'll get sucked back into the black hole of, of YouTube and they'll send you to where they want to send you. But if you search on the right hand side here, you can search by just like the fact sheets by any topic. And we have little two, three, four minute Oklahoma specific videos on controlling weeds with different methods or uh, maybe organic pe uh, pesticide and herbicide options or how to aerate your lawn all of those topics are available. I typed in irrigation and there were several dozen videos that came up on installing irrigation, things like that. So those are all things that are available to you and I encourage you to look up those resources. That's all I have. I went a little bit over today and I apologize for that. Um, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you guys.